Well, hey everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, I want to address Nicaea 2 for hopefully the last time on this channel. I have been trying to synthesize my understanding of this council, its status as an ecumenical council, its uh, binding nature on Christians, and I've kind of gone back and forth and tried to find a compromise on the issue. I've tried to engage with both sides of the equation, those who are most adamantly in affirmation that this is absolutely binding, and those who say this is not an ecumenical council that is biblical or worthy of our acceptance. And I've gone back and forth on this issue. I think Gavin Ortland made a great case against Nicaea too, um, but I've also seen a lot of really good stuff being put out by uh, Father, um, Father Mark Perkins uh, on the subject as well that has also been very helpful in synthesizing this view. And so what I would like to do in this video as an Anglican, and I'm speaking as an Anglican now, is synthesize a view of Nicaea too that I believe is biblical, right, and within the boundaries of Christian orthodoxy, biblical orthodoxy, historical orthodoxy. So one of the things that Gavin pointed out in his video, and that Father Mark Perkins has pointed out as well, is that in the early church, images were part of the early church. The question that Gavin was really trying to get at in his video on iconography in Nicaea 2 was whether or not they were venerated. And so I want to leave that aside for just a moment and, and point out that icons were a part of the early church. Images as teaching tools, as, um, as artistic display within churches and places of worship, this is a part of the early church. And so the next question should be, what is our relationship to those images? How do we engage with those images? And I think the part that's kind of missing from this discussion is that in Gavin's video, he jumps from the idea that images were not venerated to all of a sudden the church now wants to venerate images. But I think it had less to do with the fact that the church jumped from a position of we don't venerate to all of a sudden we do to how do we interact with images? What is their purpose? What is their role? And you have some on one side that are saying that not at all, no devotional, they're, they're not objects of devotion in any sense. And you have those on the other side that are saying, yes, they are. And in fact, we use them as means of grace and sacramental realities through which we, we worship God. And the council is coming together as a necessary historical reality to settle the matter. Simple as that. And so I think when we recognize and frame it that way, it's not so much that Nicaea 2 is trying to mandate icon veneration because, hey, this is, this is the way it is. It's, hey, this is a controversy and we're killing each other over this issue. And so we need to find a way to settle it. Another, frame, another way to frame this conversation, I think, in a proper way is by focusing on the part of the ecumenical council that's actually considered to be binding, the definition of the council. And again, Father Mark Perkins pointed out that this is not really talked about. Most of the time, the anathemas and the canons are brought up as kind of being the, the main arguments against Nicaea. But the definition itself, when you read it, I don't think it poses as huge a threat to people as they often think. So this is the definition, the, the most at least uh, important part of the definition of Nicaea 2. It says, We decree with full precision and care that like the figure of the honored and life-giving cross, the revered uh, the, of, and holy images, the revered and holy images, whether painted or made of mosaic or of any other suitable material, are to be exposed in the holy churches of God, on sacred instruments and vestments, on walls and panels, in houses and by public ways. These are the images of our Lord, God and Savior Jesus Christ, and of Our Lady without blemish, the Holy God-bearer, and of the rever revert, I can't say that word, the revered angels, and of any of the saintly holy men. The more frequently they are seen in representational art, the more are those who see them drawn to remember and long for those who serve as models and to pay these images the tribute of salutation and respectful veneration. Certainly, this is not the full adoration, latria, in accordance with our faith, which is properly paid only to the divine nature. But it resembles that given to the figure of the honored and life-giving cross, and also to the holy books and the gospels and to other sacred cult objects. Further, people are drawn to honor these images with the offering of incense and lights, as was piously established by ancient custom. 
Indeed, the honor paid to an image traverses it, reaching the model, and he who venerates the image venerates the person represented in that image. So it is the teaching of our holy fathers, so it is, it is that the teaching of our holy fathers is strengthened, namely, the tradition of the Catholic Church, which has received the gospel from one end of the earth to the other. So this definition ultimately simply says that icons and depictions of Christ, of the Theotokos, and of saintly holy men are to be offered salutation and respectful veneration. And this is clearly distinguished from full adoration, which is paid only to the divine nature. So there's a very, very clear line drawn here. And Gavin made a point to say that this distinction does not exist in Scripture. I think there's a case that can be made against that. But I also just want to point out, too, that... Ultimately, when it comes to reverencing other people and other things, there has to be a distinction present because we as Christians would say that we are told by scripture to honor our father and mother. We're told to honor the leaders that God has placed over us. And so the question is, is there a distinction between the honor that we show our parents and the honor that we show our leaders and the worship we pay to God? Well, obviously there's a distinction there. And so it makes sense that the council would point out that there's a distinction between the honor that we show sacred items and sacred vessels and the honor and worship and adoration that belongs to God alone. So that's, I think, a fair distinction. And again, I want to point out the honor and salutation and respectful veneration that's spoken of is not defined with any precise terms. We are not told how that veneration is to look. We are not mandated a particular form of veneration. Now, as an Anglican, I also have a duty to uphold my Anglican confession, my Anglican tradition. In my ACNA, they have a fundamental declaration of the province where they go through kind of the basic points, and this is what they say about the seven councils. Concerning the seven councils of the undivided church, we affirm the teaching of the first four councils and the Christological clarifications of the fifth, sixth, and seventh councils insofar as they are agreeable to Holy Scripture. So the question is, is it agreeable in Holy Scripture to say that adoration or latria belongs to God alone, but salutation and respectful veneration belongs to other things that are of holy or, or even a divine appointment? I think yes. I think that is a biblical um, thesis. I also think we need to root this in why is it that the images of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our Lady, um, and the saintly holy men, why is it that we are called to venerate these? Well, one, it's because Christ is the icon of the invisible God. He became incarnate. And in his incarnation, he invites us to participate in his life, in his divine life. And by way of participation... We become like Christ. We become icons of Christ to one another within the church. And so even, even two living, breathing Christians, me and say somebody else that I know who's a Christian, when we're together, we have the opportunity to honor and venerate one another as icons of Christ. And so in the same way, all the council I think is trying to point out is that these images that are depicting the true realities of Jesus Christ being the incarnate man and all of his saints and, and the mother of God is we are recognizing that by participation in the incarnation of Christ, by participation in him, they deserve our honor and our veneration in the same way that other Christians do. And so this is not an adoration, latria. This is a veneration, this is a dulia. This is a hyperdulia in the case of Mary. And so this makes a lot of sense to me. It makes a lot of sense to me that when my ACNA says, insofar as they are agreeable to Holy Scriptures, that we look at the Scriptures and say, what are the principles here? We're told to love one another. We're told to bless one another. We're told to share all things in common with one another. We're told to honor one another. And so if I can show honor to another Christian, I can certainly show honor to another saint in an icon who is depicted there as representing its prototype, which is the saint who is in heaven, alive, just as I am alive here, if not more so. So I have a duty to uphold the Christological clarification of the 5th, 6th, and 7th councils in the Declaration of the Province. 
insofar as they are agreeable to Holy Scripture, and this definition is agreeable to Holy Scripture. So then getting to the 39 Articles of Religion, Article 22, it says, The Romish doctrine concerning purgatory pardons, worshiping and adoration, as well of images and of relics, and also invocation of the saints as a fond thing vainly invented and grounded upon no warranty of Scripture, but rather repugnant to the Word of God. Now again, I want to preface this by pointing out that the Romish doctrine is under condemnation here, and the Romish doctrine concerning the things that follow. So we need to look and say, okay, what kind of abuses were going on in Roman Catholicism at the time of of the Reformation? And I do think that you do find um, an overactive devotional life to the saints. And I do believe that the Reformation reacted rightly against this when things like salvation itself was seemingly being attributed to the saints. And some might push back and say, Jonah, it was never attributed to the saints. And I agree that fundamentally it wasn't. But the point is, is that the words that were being used, the things that were being said, and the level of devotion to the saints was getting to be to a point where it seemed as though Christ and the saints and Mary were all kind of placed on the same level. And so the reformers really wanted to distinguish, hey, When we're talking about relics, when we're talking about images, when we're talking about invocation, these things cannot become idolatrous. We need to protect against the idolatry that these things can lead to. And so they write this article, the Romish doctrine concerning these things. And I think it's unique and interesting that the words worshiping and adoration are used in condemnation of images and relics. And that's the same thing that's condemned by the Seventh Council. It says, certainly this salutation and respectful veneration is not the full adoration in accordance with our faith, which is properly paid only to the divine nature. They then go on to say, the salutation and respectful veneration resembles that given to the figure of the honored and life-giving cross. And also the holy books of the Gospels. Now we as Anglicans, when the Gospels are read, we stand as the Gospel passes us. We bow our heads to it. What are we saying when we do that? This is no different than what the council is commanding us to do when it comes to icons. And so the 39 articles of religion condemn a particular abuse that was popping up in the Roman church and condemn specifically the worshiping and adoration, the superstition surrounding images and relics, not the practice wholesale. And even Thomas Cranmer, even in his homily against the peril of idolatry, which I disagree with many aspects of it. But even there, he points out that images themselves are not wrong. It's it's the use of them that can lead to idolatry. And so we must recognize that images in themselves are not sinful, are not wrong, and the church has historically never held that to be the case. It's simply how it's used. And I think the council actually does a good job of pointing out it, 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 I think people sometimes think the the Seventh Council is specifically condemning the iconoclast, but the Seventh Council is also condemning equally with equal force anybody who would offer full adoration or latria to the holy icons. So there's a condemnation on both sides. And the condemnation towards the iconoclast is kind of, I think, what most people perseverate on. But the condemnation of those who would give full adoration to icons is also on display and is echoed by our 39 articles of religion. Now, finally, I want to point out what I think Father Mark Perkins has pointed out prior, and I think it's very, very good. A lot of times the discomfort with Nicaea II has less to do with the definition of the council and more to do with the implementation of the council. Most associate veneration of icons with Eastern Orthodox practice, which includes things like excessive bowing, kissing, prostrating, crossing yourself. And people can react to that and go, okay, I don't want to sit in front of an icon of a saint praying before it over and over, lighting candles and incense. That seems very excessive. That seems idolatrous. I don't want that. That's fair. And again, I want to point out, All that the council commands in its definition is that the icons be given respectful veneration. It does not define what that looks like. It simply demands that some kind of respectful veneration be given to the icons. 
And so if we look at the East and we look at the West and we look at the differences in culture, the differences in a lot of different areas, I think it's possible for us to acknowledge that this looks a little bit different and is going to look a little bit different between the two branches of the church. And in the Western church, what is perceived to be maybe just a simple devotion in the East can be full-on veneration for us in the West. So for example, I don't bow to my icons. I don't feel comfortable doing that. The only icons that I've ever kissed are the icons of Christ that I have. And I feel comfortable doing that at times. But for the most part, my icons simply hang up in my home. I like having them hung up. I like to sit before them when I pray and meditate on the truths that they communicate to me. And to meditate on the persons that are depicted in the portraits that are, that are, that are written. And so I think that we as Christians should recognize that the Seventh Ecumenical Council is not antithetical to the gospel. It actually offers some profound Christological clarifications about the reality of the Incarnation and what that means for Christians who are joined to the body of Christ and also sell, sets a healthy boundary between veneration in, in a sense of dulia with latria, which is reserved for the Godhead alone. And I think when we have these proper distinctions, the Seventh Council actually assists us in avoiding idolatry, not hinders that.